ladies and gents. Welcome to the third installment of the Muscle and Strength Pyramid. Um, so, quick recap. We've had uh, energy balance, weight, rate of weight gain, and calorie intake as our kind of foundation of the pyramid, um, or at least our first level. Uh, and then macronutrients and fiber intake as the composition of those calories we get um, as our second level. Um, and of course, what we will eventually talk about, which is extremely important, which I don't even think is deserving of a level, but it's so important that it's your lifestyle and behavior. We'll get to that in the last episode. Um, so not really the foundation, but the first level. And now we've covered um, the easily quantifiable big picture stuff. You know, if you have your, your energy, your rate of weight gain, and the composition of that energy um, in place, uh, at least if we're just talking about nutrition and not training, you've got probably 70-80% of things sorted out. Um, so now we're going to start getting into the, um, the less important but still important um, aspects of the pyramid. Uh, right smack dab in the middle is our micronutrients, vitamins, well micronutrients are vitamins and minerals, so we have vitamins, minerals, and water intake. Um, so a really good discussion we're going to have today um, because so much of the time we're talking about your macronutrients. Um, so just to kind of set the stage a little bit, macro means, you know, big, micro means small. So uh, the reason why we have macronutrients and micronutrients is that macronutrients you need in a much greater amount compared to micronutrients. If you uh, notice that the amounts we're talking about when we talk about macronutrients are full grams, uh, often the time the amounts we're talking about in micronutrients are itty bitty fractions of that, um, milligrams on down, okay? Um, or, or if we do get up to grams, they're a couple of grams, right? Uh, so, micronutrients. Um, basically, there are two broad categories in nutrition. We have our minerals, which are inorganic, and then we have our vitamins, which are organic. Okay. Um, now, I'm not going to go through a full nutrition lesson here on all of the uh, you know, minerals and vitamins and their importance and all that stuff. Simply just Google one of them, okay? Uh, that would be the most boring video I could think of. But I am just for completeness going to go over how, the, the, what they are um, and the different categories. And I think that will give you some perspective on why you can't, uh, or probably why you shouldn't, in my opinion, just stop at your macronutrient uh, intake and without any consideration of other things. And we'll talk about how to bring that consideration into your diet. So... The minerals, okay, um, these are those inorganic things, they're on the periodic table, fun stuff. Um, we have macro minerals, meaning uh, the minerals that our body needs in a uh, greater abundance. Uh, this is straight off Wikipedia, because I didn't feel like getting out uh, my nutrition book for, for this hardcore stuff. I considered it, but I thought, you know, let's, let's get the big picture practical application in place. Um, these are in order of importance from calcium, phosphorus, potassium, sulfur, sodium, chlorine, and magnesium. Um, those of you who are a little onto it will notice a lot of those are the electrolytes, um, which ties into our water intake and all that. Uh, and then we have important trace minerals, uh, which we don't need as much of, but serve important functions in the human physiology. And we've got iron, cobalt, copper, zinc, molybdenum, uh, iodine, and selenium. And there are others. Okay? Um, so those are our inorganic ones. Uh, for vitamins, we, these are our organic ones. We have two different types of vitamins. We have fat-soluble and water-soluble. So what that means um, is that the way they're absorbed in the body is with the assistance of fat uh, through for fat soluble, you know, through the intestine, and um, and then or or with the assistance of water. And the way we excrete these things are through urine and sweat, and then much slower through the process of, of getting rid of fat. So uh, what that means? Well, let's first get into it. Okay, so we have um, a bunch of vitamins. We have A, D, E, and K. Those are our fat-soluble vitamins. So just if you can remember ADEC, you're good. And then just remember that all the rest are water-soluble. Um, and I started to write them all out, and I thought that was nonsense because there's all these complicated names for the B vitamins. There's eight of them, but basically there's like B1 through 6, uh, and it's like 9 and 12, and I forget. There's a lot of B vitamins, and then we have vitamin C. Okay, so these are our water-soluble vitamins. So there is some important things I want to uh, uh, kind of talk about, the, the differences between fat-soluble and water-soluble. 
water soluble because we urinate constantly and we drink and we have such a, a large amount of water processing through our body on a regular basis. Um, that means that water soluble vitamins are things that we need to make sure we replenish on a regular day to day basis. Okay, so it is. Uh, harder to overdose on a, a water-soluble vitamin because you can simply urinate and get rid of the, the excess. Um, however, it is easier to be deficient uh, since we, we have such a high turnover rate. Uh, the opposite of true is true of fat-soluble. Um, it is easier to overdose because it stays in our body longer. It's harder to get rid of. And likewise, it is more unlikely that you will be uh, deficient unless it's just a consistent uh, issue. It takes longer to have a deficiency build up in the fat-soluble vitamins, okay? Um, so that is kind of the big picture kind of background information that's good to have. Um, now what we need to think about is how do we ensure that our diet is set up so that we have um, respect to our minerals and our micronutrients and, our, and all that stuff. So the first one I want to talk about is the if it fits your macros um, flexible dieting mindset. And this is basically um, you know, something that I would say I've, I've been probably a part of promoting. I'm starting to focus on basically the nutrients versus just the food source. And really, we're still doing that. It's just now that we're giving respect to a broader range of nutrients. Uh, however, what I'm running into more, and it's probably because I'm dealing with a lot of folks in the middle of their contest season, is that if it fits your macros has become, how, what can I fit into these macros? What can I get away with? You know, how can I satisfy these cravings and be focused on what can I eat? versus how do I meet my nutritional needs? Uh, and you combine that with extreme hunger um, and, and dieting, and you can run into some issues with actually having some pretty ridiculous menus to meet some pretty well set up macros that can actually lead you running into problems here, okay? And problems here. So, I like flexible dieting. I love it if it fits your macros, but there are some things we want to think about so that we don't run into issues with this to where it actually ends up short-circuiting our progress, okay? Um, so, and this is the mindset of being inclusive versus exclusive. I would say that probably the if it fits your macros kind of uh, approach to nutrition was in response to the extremely restrictive and unhealthy dieting that is traditional bodybuilders to where they run themselves into a corner of only having four or five foods that they eat. Maybe two carb sources, um, no fruits during competition, but fruits in the off season, only starchy, or sorry, only uh, fibrous vegetables, and then just lean protein sources. And if you have this, this kind of exclusive clean eating type of diet, will actually have you running into micronutrient deficiencies just as well as uh, you know, some of my contest preppers right now who are doing everything they can to fit in you know, Pop-Tarts and, and silly foods you know, in excess to the point where they don't have any micronutrient uh, density in their diet. Either way, to an extreme, can have you running into problems with, with your, your nutrition uh, profile, okay? So, what I want to introduce is a mindset of being inclusive versus exclusive. That means that these healthy foods that are, have a, basically a high micronutrient density, um, we want to think about including them in the diet versus trying to exclude things from the diet that might not have that nutrient density. Uh, there are very few, if any, foods that are actively unhealthy for you, that when you eat them, they harm your body. You know, a Twinkie, a Pop-Tart, um, all of these foods, the problem is that they're devoid of micronutrients. Not that they are, not completely devoid, but compared to, to other whole foods, are typically devoid of the micronutrient profile, and that if they dominate your diet, then you can run into issues, right? So it's not that we need to remove them from the diet, it's that we need to make sure that we have included the quote-unquote healthy foods, okay? So this is something that my more old-school guys, who I am actually, who went from old school to learning kind of about the approaches to focusing on nutrients versus food sources, tend to get instinctually. Yeah, I want to eat these healthy foods, and if I can work on this, awesome. I used to not be able to do that, that's great. Um, the younger generation, it's, it's almost this kind of like rebellion of, Look what I can eat, bro. You mad? I'm in great shape. But then I get the email from them, and it's like, oh, I'm really tired. My energy is really low. I'm really f starving. Uh, and, and I don't know why, but my, I'm just super pale, and my sleep patterns are messed up. And we start running into problems when I find out. I'm like, oh, well, what are you eating? And they start telling me, and, and we have issues with, with hunger adherence and possibly even uh, micronutrient deficiencies. 
So, enough of my little rant on there, but basically the take home message is I want you guys to focus on having an inclusive versus an exclusive diet. So we want to include those healthy foods, we want to ensure we have micronutrient density, but make sure you also have the foods you enjoy, you know? Um, it's more a matter of making sure the diet is healthy versus making sure the diet is not unhealthy, okay? So good balance is always essential. So how do we do that? Okay. So, fruit and fibrous vegetable intake. The reason why I'm focusing on these food sources is because typically the average bodybuilder is going to be good to go uh, in terms of having adequate intake uh, of micronutrient minerals that come from your starchy carbs, especially in the off-season, uh, your meats, um, and you know, dairies, especially in the off-season, uh, you know, things like that, eggs, and, and a lot of the, um, the micronutrients that come from those food sources. And what we need to make sure we also have intact is the fruits and veggies, okay? Um, so first off, we have it categorized based on calorie intake. So we've got all the way to the lightweight women uh, who might be dieting, maybe, all the way up to our off-season males who are typically heavier, uh, up to you know, 4,000 calories. And I've kind of broken it down roughly kind of based on uh, the food pyramid guidelines of how to get enough servings of fruit and vegetables. And we have cups per day of each, okay? So that means if you're eating 1,200 to 2,000 calories per day, you want to get a minimum serving of two cups of fibrous vegetables and, and fruit uh, per day, okay? That may seem difficult, um, but, uh, and, and, and sometimes if you're on a low-carb diet, it's very difficult to do that fruit part, but you can definitely uh, look around and see what is the lowest, uh, what, what has the best volumetric profile, which means the most volume of fruit and vegetable for the lowest amount of uh, macronutrients and calories. So something like berries would be good in the versus a banana if you're trying to get uh, a small amount of carbohydrates but a large amount of fruit in terms of volume. Okay, so think about that. Um, and then as we get higher, we get up to uh, three cups each for 2,000 to 3,000 calories and then four cups each for 3,000 to 4,000 calories. If you're eating more than that, maybe eat you know, five cups each, but you're gonna have a tough time getting that many calories down if you're eating that much fruit and vegetables, and you're probably fine if you're up into the three, four cups a piece. So this is a good guideline I like. Uh, benefit of this is when you're dieting, these foods tend to be high in fiber, high in satiety, um, and will probably make the diet more, more consistent. Um, they're very low calorie items, so you're gonna feel like you're eating more food uh, despite the fact that your calories are the same. Um, so that's one of, one of the downsides of a poorly set up uh, food sources for if it fits your macros. If you're eating all very high energy density foods, um, you're going to feel like you're not eating anything and still getting the same amount of calories. Okay, So that's fruit and vegetables. And that, on top of well set up macros, is probably going to sort you out here. And if it doesn't, there's some things we can recommend during supplementation, especially during a diet, that should. But we'll get to that on, on that level. Uh, the final piece I want to talk about in this episode is water intake. Um, so, first off, I want you to count all your fluids except alcohol. Uh, yes, even coffee, even things that we see as dehydrating, but, al but alcohol we're not going to count because it is very dehydrating, okay, in comparison to things like coffee, okay. Uh, basically, it, it makes you urinate more, okay. Um, so, all fluids, whether it's diet soda, milk, juice, water, uh, or coffee or tea, count towards this intake. So keep that in mind. Uh, so a rough way of doing it is using body weight, which is good. Um, it's a good place to start if you've never really tracked your water intake, but there is a better way, which we're going to talk about in a second. So to start, um, for the Americans out there and those who are used to the uh, imperial system of pounds, two-thirds of your body weight in pounds in fluid ounces. Okay, So that means if you're, let's say, 210, that would be... 140 fluid ounces per day of liquid. Okay. Now, for those of you who are going, what the hell is a fluid ounce? And I don't know my body weight in pounds. You can convert from kgs to pounds, 2.2 pounds per kilogram, and there are roughly 34 fluid ounces per liter. Okay. So hopefully that will help you. And if you type things into Google, it'll automatically um, convert it. You can type in fluid ounces to, uh, to to liters. You can type in milliliters to fluid ounces. You can type in kilograms to pounds, and you can sort yourself out. Now that said, um, good guideline for those of you who don't really know how much you drink. A better way to do this, and I want to uh, shout out and source Lyle McDonald. This is not um, 
my information is that five of your daily urinations should be clear. And the reason why this is not based on body weight is that at the same body weight, two people can have a very different um, hydration status, meaning that one person habitually drinks a lot more water and thus urinates more or has a much higher sweat rate. Um, and, and depending on differences in training, how much cardio you're doing, the climate you live in, all these things are going to have a massive impact uh, on, on your hydration status. So if you've got a, um, an inactive sweater living in Alaska who does uh, you know, low volume training three times a week versus a guy who is in Saudi Arabia who is a profuse sweater who trains six times a week and does cardio and has poor uh, air conditioning, they're going to need massively different water intakes. So a good way to look at it is that five of your daily urination should be clear which of course would mean that a minimum uh, a number of urinations per day would be five. And that means you can have more urinations than five that aren't clear, but at least five of them should be clear. And probably a couple of them should be around your training, meaning that you're at, at, you know, hydrating well during your training. Because even a 2% decrease in performance, sorry, even a 2% decrease in body weight from fluid losses can cause decreases in some performance. So we want to make sure that we're especially hydrated around, in and around training, okay? So, good place to roughly start, better way to think about it, um, and that is level three of the pyramid. Let's bring it in so you guys can see the big picture. All right, level three, we have our minerals, important trace and macros, macro minerals. We have our vitamins, fat soluble and water, water soluble. We have how to get your diet set up so that you can make sure you have minerals and, uh, and vitamins taken care of. So we want an inclusive versus exclusive approach. And then how many servings of fruit and fibrous vegetables each in cups per day you should have based on your calorie intake. Okay. And then lastly, we have water intake, which counts not just water, but all fluids besides alcohol. And we roughly want two-thirds of your body weight in pounds, in fluid ounces. And remember that for you guys on the metric system, one liter is roughly 34 fluid ounces, and one kilo is roughly 2.2 pounds. But an even better way to do it, thank you, Lyle McDonald, is that five of your daily urinations should be clear, which would mean a minimum of five urinations per day. And I would go further to say that at least one or two urinations should happen uh, during or after training. All right, guys, that's the pyramid, and I'll talk to you guys next time.